Good morning. Thanks very much to Steve and Debbie for the readings. If you've got your Bible with you, it'd be good if you could keep it open at that passage that we've had just read to us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But before we turn to God's words, let's just bow our heads to pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to meet together this morning. I thank you for the great truths contained in the songs that we've sung. And we thank you most of all that your word tells us that you inhabit the praises of your people. So we thank you for your presence here amongst us this morning. And as we turn to your word, we give you thanks for the scriptures. I thank you that we're able to meet freely like this to open your word together. We pray for your help and guidance as we look through this passage. I pray that you might challenge us and yet encourage us at the same time as we look at your word. And I pray that through the preaching of your word it would be the Lord Jesus who would be exalted and that we would leave this place praising his name for he deserves all the glory. We pray in his name. Amen. Do you know, when I was a child, uh, we used to go on holiday every summer to France. Twelve summers in a row, we went to France. And I remember on, on one occasion, we were driving along the idyllic countryside, and the, the fields were golden, the flowers were in full bloom, and we entered this uh, picturesque, beautiful little village. And as we approached, the sign said, this town is twinned with Cope Bridge, Glasgow. <laughs> now, I don't know if you've ever been to Cope Bridge in Glasgow, but we were certainly wondering whether the people in this little village in France had ever been to Cope Bridge in Glasgow. We were wondering how somewhere so beautiful, so picturesque could be twinned with somewhere so grey and dull and bleak as Coat Bridge in Glasgow. Well, this morning we're continuing our series in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it could be said that this passage, this chapter, is twinned with Genesis chapter 3. Now, just as you might wonder, how can such a beautiful village in the Loire Valley in France be twinned with a grey, bleak town in Glasgow. You, you, you might be tempted to wonder how this chapter that we've been looking at in, in recent weeks, such a majestic chapter, which focuses on the hope of the resurrection, that focuses on the wonder of the new creation. How, how could it be twinned? How could it be linked with a chapter that's known as the fall? But it is. Because Paul says in verse 45, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. You see what Paul's doing here? He's, he's setting this chapter that we're looking at this morning, he's setting this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, in the context of Genesis chapter 3. He's saying that we can't really expect to understand the great truths that are contained in this passage unless we first understand the great predicament of the fall in Genesis. This chapter isn't really going to make any sense to us unless first we cast our minds back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You see, ever since Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they rejected God's word, when they turned their back on him, when, when they put themselves first, since that moment, the world has been in need of a savior. The world has been in need of one who would come who could conquer the penalty of death. Someone who could restore our right relationship with God. And Jesus, 
is that Savior. Jesus is the last Adam. And that's why Paul says at the beginning of this chapter that it was, it was really of first importance to him to write to the Corinthians and, and to tell them about Jesus. It was of first importance to Paul to tell them about Jesus that, that he died for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. And then he, he starts to build his argument as the chapter goes along and he says, you know, if Christ was raised on the third day, then it's logical that we as believers, that we being in Christ will also be raised in him to new life. But then we get to verse 35 and I think Paul starts to anticipate what the response might be at this stage from some of the Corinthian believers. He says, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? And you know, over the next few verses, we start to see Paul's great skill as a communicator. I get very jealous of Paul here because he starts to use all sorts of different illustrations to, to make his point. He, he talks of farming he speaks about all different kinds of animals. He even speaks about astronomy. He, he uses all these different illustrations to try and connect with his reader. You know, I, I get jealous because I feel all my illustrations are pretty much about golf. But here he is using all of these different examples in order to try and connect with the Corinthian church. But, you know, I think one of the points that Paul is making is that we don't need to worry. We don't need to worry about what our bodies will be like in the new creation. You know, we, we can trust God to get it right. God has already made all sorts of different kinds of bodies here on earth, each one fit for its environment. You know, he's, he's made the animals for the land and the birds for the air and the fish for the sea. And so Paul was saying, I think, to the Corinthians and to us, you know, we need to trust God. I think God knows what he's doing. And he's going to make us a body. He's going to create us a body that will be fit for purpose. It will be fit for living in eternity in heaven. And I think in one sense, as we consider that body, there will be continuity with our earthly bodies. We know that Jesus was, was recognizable to the disciples when he appeared to them. So I think, you know, we'll be able to recognize one another in heaven. But there's also a sense in which we will be completely transformed. Paul says in verse 37, what you sow is not the body that is to be. And he uses this farming illustration. We, we all know that when a seed is planted, it dies, and then it is transformed into new life. And, and the, the crop or the tree that that seed produces doesn't really resemble the original seed. It's been transformed. It's quite different. And so it will be with our heavenly bodies. Paul says, you know, there are heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly body is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. I think Paul's really saying to the Corinthians here, you know, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry about the minor details. You can trust God. God knows what he's doing. Instead, just rejoice that you're going to be part of this new creation. Don't worry about what your heavenly body will be like. Just rejoice about how great it's going to be in heaven. Do we ever stop to think about that? Paul says here, you know that your earthly body is perishable but your heavenly body will be imperishable. He says your earthly body is weak, but one day we're going to be raised in power. Do we ever stop to think about what that means? Our heavenly body will not get tired. We won't get sick. We won't worry. We won't get anxious in heaven. We won't be jealous in heaven. I think we often get bogged down in the minor details in the Christian life. 
How often do we just rejoice? How often do we rejoice that after we die, we will be raised with Christ? Just as that seed is planted and it dies, it will be raised to new life. It will be transformed to new life. How often do we give God thanks for that? As George Herbert once said, death used to be an executioner, but because of the gospel, death is now just a gardener. That's fantastic. How often do we rejoice in the hope that we have? How often do we think about it? How often do we rejoice in the hope that we have in Christ? And we we need to remember, it's important to remember that we only have that hope because of Christ. That's why Paul is writing this letter. That's why he's writing this passage. You know, he says back in verse 1, Now I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of this gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Paul says it's only because of Christ, it's only because of the good news of Jesus, it's only because of the gospel that we are saved. Do you know, my aunt and uncle were missionaries for many years in Tanzania, in Africa, and I I spent quite a few summers uh, with them out there. And I had some friends who lived just about half a mile down the road from where they stayed. And I remember on one occasion I had, had spent the day with these friends and by the time I came to leave their house, the sun had gone down. Now you might not think that that's a big deal, but this was out in the countryside and there were no street lights, and there were no houses between my friend's house and my aunt and uncle's house. So it was incredibly dark. It was as dark as you can imagine, and I don't mind admitting to you that I was a bit scared. And I set off on this short journey back to my aunt and uncle's house, and like a scene from a scary movie, I could hear some footsteps coming up behind me. So I just started to walk a little bit more quickly. No need to panic. And the footsteps started to get quicker behind me. So again, I started to go a little bit more quickly again, and the footsteps got faster and faster behind me until I could sense that this person was right on my shoulder. And in that moment, all I could think to do was to turn around and shout, Habari Yako! Now, Habari Yako is just a greeting. It's just a way of saying, how are you? But it's actually a very formal greeting. It it literally means, tell me the news of your day. So you've got to picture the scene here, okay? Here I am in complete darkness. I'm scared. I sense that I've got an attacker right behind me. I'm on the verge of death. And all I could think to do was to say, tell me the news of your day. Now, as it turns out, this was a friend of mine who had seen me from some way off leaving my friend's house and thought it'd be funny to to run up behind me and play a bit of a prank on me. So I've survived to tell the tale. But it was ridiculous to think that in that moment when I genuinely thought I was on the verge of death, that I would be saved by being nice. And yet that is often the attitude that people have towards God's judgment. I don't believe the gospel I don't think there's a God, but if there is, hopefully he'll think I'm a good person. Hopefully I've done enough good things to get to heaven. Hopefully God will see that I'm a nice guy. Being nice isn't what saves us. Paul reminds us that it's only the gospel that saves us. It's only Jesus that saves us. But you notice that he says in verse 1 that this is an ongoing thing. He says we are being saved by the gospel. It's these great truths of the gospel which help us to grow as Christians. It's these great truths of the gospel that will one day allow us to be transformed into new life with Christ. Paul says that Jesus is, is renewing the image of God in us. 
He says that in verse 49. This is where you've got to remember that this chapter is is twinned with Genesis 3. It's linked with Genesis 3. You see, we, we all know that the first Adam was made in the image of God. But then Adam and Eve sinned. They fell. But now Christ, who is the second Adam, is renewing us in the image of God. That's what Paul says in verse 49. He says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is part of what it means to grow as a Christian. It's being renewed in the image of God. Paul says that to to the Ephesians, as we had read. He said, put on the new self, which is created in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. That's part of what it means for us to grow as Christians, is to bear the image of the man of heaven the second Adam. But what does it mean to have the image of God renewed in you? Well, I came across a wonderful quote this week uh, by C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, in in which he talks about this subject. And, And Lewis says this, the command, be ye perfect, is not a command to do the impossible. God is going to make us into creatures that can obey that command. If we let him, for we can prevent him if we choose, he will make the feeblest and filthiest of us into a dazzling, radiant, immortal creature, pulsating all through with such energy and joy and wisdom and love as we cannot now imagine. A bright stainless mirror which reflects back to God perfectly. Though of course on a smaller scale, God's own boundless power and delight and goodness. Now this process will be long and in parts very painful. But that is what we are in for, Lewis says. Nothing less. God meant what he said. That's fantastic, isn't it? God is making us into a bright, stainless mirror. That's the perfect definition of what the Bible means about us bearing the image of God. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, says, We all with unveiled faces are reflecting as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Do you know, last week I went to the theatre and I went to see the show Beauty and the Beast. And if, if you've ever seen the film or perhaps you've gone to see the stage show, you'll, you'll know that uh, in that musical, the, the Beast has a magic mirror in which he can see whatever image it is that he wants to see. All he has to do is talk to the mirror and it will show him whatever he wants to see. That's a magic mirror. We all know that that is not how mirrors work. We all know how mirrors work. Mirrors display what they are facing. They They are filled with the image of what they are facing so that they present the image of what they are facing. They look like what they are facing. You know, if I, if I take my Bible here, this is clearly not a mirror. If I f- hold this up towards you, then it's still just a black Bible. If I turn it to face me, it's still just a black Bible. It doesn't have the qualities of a mirror. But a mirror is different. Whatever you turn it towards, it, it fills with. It's filled with that image. It displays that image back to you. So if I was to hold a mirror up towards you, then the mirror would be filled with the image of you guys. If I turned the mirror towards me, it would be filled with the image of me. It would look just like me. And the Bible says that we have been created in such a way where our hearts are like mirrors. And that if we turn towards God, we are filled with him. 
And by the power of the Holy Spirit over time, we start to resemble him. Do you know, when you think about it, as you go through life, whatever it is that you're turned towards, that's what you'll become filled with. You know, so if, if you're very inward focusing, if you're, if you're always turned towards yourself, focused on yourself, that's what you'll become filled with. You'll only think about yourself. You'll always put yourself first. You know, if, you, if you're turned towards your career, if you're focused on your career, that's what you'll be filled with. That's what your heart will be filled with. If, if you're always turned towards your, your family, your husband, your wife, maybe your pursuit of a husband or a wife, then that's what you'll be filled with. That's what your heart will be filled with. So let me just ask you, what, what are you turned towards? What are you focusing on in life? What are you filled with? Do you know, as Christians, we should be turned towards God so that we are filled with Him. And as that happens, we will be renewed in his likeness will be re renewed in his image. And do you know, what, whatever it is that you're filled with, there will then be an outpouring. People will see the evidence of that in your life. As we become filled with God, as we start to resemble God, people will see that in the way that we're living. There will be evidence of it. We'll, we'll start to display the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are qualities, these are attributes that maybe we find it easy to just rhyme them off. But can you imagine if they were so evident in our lives? Can you imagine if they were so evident in our church? What a difference that would make. We need to be thankful for the Lord Jesus, the second Adam, the, the man of heaven. For it's only because of him that these qualities, these attributes, these fruits of the Holy Spirit can be evident in our lives. It's through him that we are saved. It's through him that we are made new. And it's as we turn to him that our hearts acting as a mirror are filled with his image and we become more like him, we become more Christ-like. So how important it is then that we do turn to him, that we turn to Christ, that we might be saved, that we would go on being saved, that we might start to bear his image, that one day we may be raised to new life in him with a new heavenly body. It's so important because Paul says in verse 50, and we'll close with this, he says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. We cannot enter heaven without Christ. We cannot enter the kingdom of heaven just as we are. So let me close with an illustration about golf. You know, as I read that verse, verse 50, a, a story has been on my mind. It's a story I'm, I've, I know I've shared with you before. But the golf, has also, the golf has been on this weekend, hasn't it? If you're a golf fan, you'll know that the USPGA, the second major of the year, has been on. And so this story has been on my mind most of the week because, you know, my favorite golf tournament is the first major of the year that was played last month, and that's the US Masters. And some of you might know the, the prize that the players are trying to win at the Masters. I think, I think they get about $2 million these days if they win that tournament. 
and they get a fancy little trophy as well, but that's not actually what the players have got in mind as they, as they visualize holding the winning putt. You see, the winner of the Masters gets presented with a green jacket. Now, it's actually quite an ugly, garish green jacket. But that's what the players want to win. They want to win the famous green jacket. And the reason for that is that Augusta National, the golf club where the Masters uh, takes place, it's one of the most exclusive golf clubs in the world. The only way that you can be a member is if you've got a green jacket. That's the only way you can get into the clubhouse. Now, for any of you who have seen me swing a golf club, you'll know that I'm never going to win my green jacket. And that still makes me sad to this day. So the only way that I'll ever get into Augusta National is if Tiger Woods was to give me his green jacket. And I could put that jacket on and I could boldly walk through the front door of the clubhouse and I could enjoy all the, the benefits of being a member of that great club. Not because of anything that I had done, of course. All because of what someone else had done for me. And the Bible says it's exactly the same with salvation. We'll never get into the kingdom of heaven by our own efforts. We'll never earn favor with God. We'll never get into heaven simply by being nice. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But you know, through trusting in the Lord Jesus, the Bible says that God has clothed us in the garments of salvation. He wraps us in the robe of righteousness. And that is why we can look forward to being resurrected with a new heavenly body one day. That's why we can look forward to being raised to new life in Christ. Not because of anything that I've done. You know, just like my golf, my, my efforts in life fall way short but all because of the Lord Jesus, all because of what Jesus has done on the cross. God clothes us in his son's righteousness. That's why we can look forward to our heavenly body. That's why we can look forward to being raised one day in glory. Let's give God thanks for that great truth. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that it's only because of him that we are saved. We thank you that in him we are being saved. And we thank you that we are being transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on him, that we might rejoice in the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus. And I pray too, Father, that you would give us the boldness to go and share the good news of the Lord Jesus with others that we come into contact with this week. We pray all of these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.